So we can 
the code when the person is later, and uh, so then uh, so then you can vote. So please vote if you choose the first option or you choose the second option. Okay, so let's start. Today's lecture is about limit, and I think that I really like this lecture. It goes from many places to more application and everything else. So, today we'll be learning together, we're having like a refresher about chemical composition, and we'll go to enter enter purification. We'll talk about the motion of the motion bio, and we'll bring you quickly just to give you a better basics for the next time. Next week we'll be practicing about this. We'll talk about fat replacer and section. And section five, we're about acidity and lipid oxidation. So when I put this and the first slide and the second slide, this is kind of another way to me for me to tell you the core the, the, the learning objective of this lecture, of this section, of this lecture. So instead of writing learning objective, etc. I prefer putting it this way. So uh, let's start with the first one. I should get a pointer. So then instead of going coming back and forth. Okay, so when we talk about lipids, we can distinguish between oils and fats. Oils usually or they are liquid and fats are solid. So I put that in between brackets with acids because solids can also be a blend of liquid and solid fats. So it's a mixture. We'll see probably later. So this why? Because this is due to the variation of the variability in triglyceride composition. Because there is a hydrogenity in the triglycerol, this is why we need a blend. And this one we have a blend of solid and liquid. And this is what we call, usually we call it solid solid. I added to your class, so you call it on your slide. And what we call plastic fat. So plastic fat is a combination or a blend between liquid and salt. When we have liquids, we can distinguish them based on their composition. So we have fatty acids, we have mono and diglyceride. That's all. So these are the mono and uh, for the mono and the diglyceride. We have the solids, so these are the most the components of the emulsifier. We have the triglycerides, and these are the fats, and uh, these are what uh, present mostly in fat. Uh, and as I said, so the uh, these glycerides and the solids, they these are what they compose or they consider or use as emulsifiers because of their structure. When we talk about fatty acids, these fatty acids vary and change based on their structure. So these are part of the triglyceride. So we have we'll see it in two slides. This is part of a, a very special. You have seen this in, in chemistry course. So these are esters of glycerols and fatty acids. So we have a glycerol fat bond and we have the three fatty acids. So these are the main um, mainly present the, uh, many composing or many present in the food and uh, they can be present as uh, within the food matrix or we can also have free fatty acids and then free fatty acids their presence is an indicator of spoiled food so when we have spoilage or acidity or other spoilages we can just measure there, is, there are different ways of measuring fatty acids and this is how we can uh, we can we can uh, see the source or detect the storage. The fatty acid change based on the red. So we have C fifteen, C six, twelve, etc. Number of fat bonds. Um, they have they differ uh, vary based on their presence or or absence of the double bond. So they can be either saturated or unsaturated, saturated fatty acid or unsaturated. So there are a number of uh, and the composition of double bonds. So either we have monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fatty acids. And obviously, when we talk about saturated and saturated sorry, we will talk about trans and cis configuration. So when we have saturated, so meaning there is a zero double bond. Uh, so this is the way how 
in the top uh, an example of omega-3. So if you see C18, C uh, if we if we come, so so if we come from the plant boxes COH here, the double bond should be at uh, uh, here, if we come from the metal, the double bond should be at, should start at carbon. Uh, no, should what's it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, fifteen. And then the omega three because it's the metal this way. So this red, this is how we count. So this is the omega three. Same example for the omega six. Configuration. See, when I said there is a trans and there is a cis configuration, you have seen this so many times already. So we have a cis configuration. So we have the H one side and the O on the other side. And we have the H here that is inverse or like the, the configuration is at the opposite from the both side of the double bond. So this is what we call the trans. And then the trans, if you remember from the first lecture, they are, they are associated with some health adverse effect, and then trans fat, trans fat uh, have been banned from the market, uh, from the LED market for a few years. Okay, when we talk about lipids, we can characterize them, we can distinguish them based on their physical properties. So here, uh, mostly when we find these properties, uh, it says uh, physical physical properties, uh, but they should be considered as chemical, physical, or chemical properties because these are like based on many. Yes, um, we are talking about physical um, uh, composition, etc. But we're also talking about chemical reactions, etc. So this is why I prefer you may find in books physical properties. Some they said chemical properties. Uh, this is just to, to tell you. So, when we talk about this, we should talk about saponification value. So, this is a value or a technique to help us um, determining or identifying or measuring the molecular weight of, uh, of uh, fat or, or lipid. Uh, we have the iodine value. Uh, these are they help us indirectly determining the degree in saturation. We'll see it in few slides. And you might have seen, I'm skipping, I, uh, uh, I skipped a few slides. No, I didn't skip, so like, I, they are hidden in my, uh, in my PowerPoint, but you have them. So these are extra slides. So these are just for you to, when I say extra slides, this is just kind of a refresher. This is why I'm not showing them to you. It's just for you, extra, extra slide for you. Then we'll be talking about melting points. So the transition from solid to a liquid. This is a very important property for, for uh, lipid. We'll talk about, when we talk about properties, it's very important to consider the, the distribution uh, of, of the three of the the three goes right, for mainly the distribution and the position of fatty acid within the plant board, and the crystallinity. Yes, lipid can form crystals, the same as water. Same, I, I didn't show it here, but it's the same. So the nucleation and then the propagation. So crystallinization of the lipid is different, so it, um, it doesn't have to be at minus uh, 1 or 20, etc. to form crystals. Crystallization of lipids can happen at different temperature depending on the melting temperature of the catalyst. Okay, let's talk about the saponification. What does this mean? So by definition, it is a process involving the hydrolytic of fat, the gun fat, uh, on its reaction with the alkyl which leads to the formation of glycerol and salt of fat. What does this mean? So we have a, few, a fat hydrochloride here, so we have, and then it is hydrolyzed in presence of an alkyl. So here in this case, we have 
decay voltage. So potassium hydroxide. It can also be sodium hydroxide and then N AOH. So you may see sodium hydroxide. And which this hydrolysis will lead to the formation of glycerol. So you can see here uh, like there is an hydrolysis of the ester uh, uh, formation and then a formation of specific product that is called um, a, a salt of fatty acid. Here, because we're using potassium, we call it potassium salt of fatty acid. And what is this? It's simply a salt. So this precipitate or potassium salt or salt of fatty acid is also So we need to break the six languages. 
So this is why we need enough time. So we can't we doing this, we will consume more KOH, or if we use NOH, we consume more compared to this one. Because here we only have three ester linkages, and then the top one we have six. So yes, the, 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 the way is the same, but the amount required depends on the molecular weight. So, and it is known that lower molecular weight of fatty acid, the more you need KOH. So the top one, you have lower molecular weight, you have need more uh, KOH to suffer fat, and then this is uh, is considered as the higher saponification amount. So saponification is inversely related or inversely associated with the molecular weight. Higher molecular weight, lower saponification, and we will see an example of an experiment. So why do we need this? Yes. So we identify it, we need we we identify the molecular weight, but why how it's used? This technique or this saponification value or this specific properties of this. So in addition to identifying and determining molecular weight, because there is, as I said, there is a specific formula, we, there is a number of milligrams per gram. So if we know a number of milligrams, we can identify and then vice versa. And then if you go in, there are charts. So it is known, for example, I don't know, milk, Milk, uh, milk fat, you see the suit here in this slide, um, has a range of specific, specific fatty acids, uh, specific supplementation. Uh, vegetable oils. So most of the vegetables, they have a known or a known range of supplementation value. So for example, if you're working in quality control lab, you don't have to do it every time. So you have a chart and then you, uh, if you're controlling different products, so you have a chart, and then you, you do your saturation, and you go to your chart to see where can, where, where to compare your values, and to can identify the molecular way, or identify the, the product. So, this simplification is important because it's used for the detection of adulteration of daily products with cheaper fats and oil. Uh, milk fat are uh, considered as, uh, you may be surprised, as um, expensive fats. Yeah, put it this way. So, milk fats are expensive uh, in terms of the amount produced and so on. So, when fat, fat, when milk is collected from farmer, so usually it's set, uh, it's over because if the farmer collects milk, cow milk or other animal milk, so if they let it set, sit for a specific time, there is a separation between, but milk is an emulsion. Um, so there is a separation between fat layer and liquid layer. And it's easily, easy to collect the fat from the milk and use it and sell it. So for example, farmers can do it. So they sell the, the free fat milk and they can sell the butter alone. And because the butter is more expensive, so this is one. Um, then the, uh, a way of doing a quality control when, for example, Let's say you, you, you work in an industry, uh, in an industrial that is that you are making uh, yogurt or cheese, etc. So milk are collected from different farmers, and when they arrive to the place, there is what we call quality control. So quality control, we first measure. So they are very easy because you know people are sitting hundreds of. Hence, um, 
by hour, so we they cannot do. So there is a quick quality control. So they measure the density of him with a dust meter. So they just kind of, kind of like a, a small tool. They throw it in the in the mill, and they see the density. So the density is an indicator of person's amount of fat. Before, so it's like an reception. Before it goes to other productions, etc. So if there is, if they see that it, it is very liquid and they have no fat, uh, or it's defectuous, the milk is rejected, so it's returned to the farm. So and that, a way of adulteration is that when these farmers remove the fat, they add another fat just to make. Uh, to make it um, rich in fat and, and then to kind of substitute the butter or make fat with another fat. In terms of density, because usually they give you specific fat, in terms of density, uh, there is no difference. But in terms of fatty acid, there is a difference. So this is how we can distinguish. So milk fat are known to have a short or a medium fatty acid. So it's the, the range from C4 to C6, or the medium one, the medium chain, they, they, they range from 8 carbons down to 12 carbons. The saponification value uh, is around 220, to, it's, it's an average of 220, it goes up to 230 max. Of, of milk fat. What these farmers can do, they mix it with cheaper oils or fats that are mostly vegetable fats. And they have a carbon chains that are longer. Carbon chains longer, meaning saponification value lower. And this is how, for example, they, they need, this is the best way to identify if there is an adulteration of it. So you do it, so you do the sacrification and you see. Um, there is one thing, coconut oil has a sacrification value that is close to, um, closer to milk because it has shorter, yeah, this is a coconut oil, yeah, it should be coconut oil. It has a shorter saponification value. It is closer, it's about 235 or 237. It's very closer to the milk. But then, these oils are expensive, yet they are vegetable oils. So the people cannot, the, the farmers cannot really afford to buy these to substitute. So this is why, um, this is just for your own knowledge. Uh, you need to know why we use it. Uh, uh, so, another example. Iodine. So it's a matter of the degree and saturation. Why? So in iodine, so we have an iod. When they are mixed, so they are linked, and so they are mixed with the unsaturated. So the iodine they link or uh, they are associated to the C carbon in a double bond. So this association will help us. So this is a saturation technique. So this association will help us to identify the unsaturation. So if there is, um, uh, uh, so if we see that uh, uh, in the titration, so it's, it's a colorimetric test. So if we see that the color changes, uh, we measure the, the volume of iodine that we added to the solution, and then we can predict the, the number or the, the degree of unsaturation. more we have iodine, meaning, so more we add iodine, meaning more unsaturated, uh, uh, there is more unsaturation, and there is higher susceptibility of oxidation. So, for example, if you have two double bonds, you will need more, more uh, iodine to, uh, more iodine for, for, to, for, to change the color, so this color is color metric reaction. So this is why you, you identify if you have a higher amount or more or less unsaturation, and this can help you predict the, uh, 
the, uh, the uh, oxidation. So if you remember, the oxidation is associated with the unsaturation. So this is a kind of chart. So these are common, so it's, uh, people did it a long time ago. So there are charts having the iodine values in each product. So there is a range of iodine values. And you can see, so unsaturated fats are, have uh, different iodine, uh, iodine compared to the saturated. So this is the technique, so usually, so there is, so we have uh, the iodine, there is the color with the um, changes, so the color, the, the color changes from N for from pink to black, uh, to black red, and then we use a spectrum for the meter to have a specific measurement of this. How do we use it? So we use it, why it changes this dramatically weird here? So we use, we use it for rapid fortification, uh, fortification of edible oils. So for example, uh, you have an oil that is sold as an unsaturated fat, or omega-3 or omega-6 fat, but in reality is not. So the best way to see or to identify if you, yes or no, you are uh, getting or you are, you are, so people are receiving or have, or this, it is true that these are uh, omega-3 or omega-6 oils, so is the, uh, uh, the uh, IoT value. These techniques, because so these are easy to measure, they are kind of portable uh, tools, so they are kits. They are easily used or commonly used in food industry, by industrial, by quality controllers, and even people in the government for who can who are involved in quality When we talk about melting temperature or melting point, so melting point is melting temperature, so it's a switch from solid to a liquid. Saturated fatty acids uh, have higher melting points. So as you can see here, for example, uh, they go from 44 degrees to 77 or even higher degrees. These are from uh, saturated fat. So more you have uh, uh, carbon from higher molecular weight is associated with higher the melting temperature. So for example, if you have 14 carbon, the temperature is 44 degrees. If you have uh, 20 carbon, it's 77. So, and this is why, for example, saturated fats are solid at room temperature because their melting temperature is very high. Uh, the opposite, and saturated fats, so it is for the same length, the melting point can drop. So for example, we have C18 saturated, the temperature is 70 degrees. For the same, but unsaturated, the temperature can easily drop to senior 46 um, trans, so the trans are uh, only the one temperature. Only if I say the cis one, it's the melting temperature is 13 degrees, so and some, this is why most of unsaturated fatty acid fats or, or they are oils, they are oils and then they are liquid at room temperature because the melting temperature is, is lower. And then, so, uh, there, so for the same length, the melting uh, temperature or the point drops and this increases. Uh, there is an uh, inverse association between the temperature and the temperature. So, when we talk about melting temperature, and this is what, what we do in the industry. So we play with, we'll see it in, uh, later or in, uh, even next week, we play with the saturated and unsaturated, the chain, the length, if you try to move, if you want to have the, uh, um, uh, an oil or a fat that is easily melting or not. So melting uh, can, as I said, change from one from one uh, beta on the length. So here is the melting of C18 
protein is steroid acid is 70 degrees, while C protein is 44 degrees. Either it will as a free fatty acid, like a low, or they are in a trigger slide. This should be the same, so the melting should be higher with higher molecular weight and exit point. So logically we should have a trigger slide that is formed of six fatty, three, six, three fatty acid of steroid should have higher melting temperature compared to the trigger slide. So the, you may see in books that for a group of steroid acid as a fatty acid, it's 68, six, uh, 70. Here, the trigger slide, the temperature can drop a little bit. You will see, uh, it can be 65, 68, but usually it's the same. But still, it's always higher than the trigger slide of mystery acid. Okay, is trigger slide varying in the positioning of the fatty acid? So, position is very important over fatty acid. So here we have a trigger slide. We have the fatty acid that are positioned on the glycerol backbone. Here we have three position groups. So these are three glass figure slides. So there are three fatty acids. So we have three positions. So we have position one, position two, and position three. And then this is what we call stereoscopic numbering, or SN. You will see it very commonly in fatty acid. So this is where we have. Usually there is a specific configuration of the fatty acid. So we have SN, S2 is, is how, this is the way how they are represented in like um, uh, in this scheme or like how they're drawn. Um, so SN, the steroid number is usually drawn on the left. So this is just to give you an idea. We have three glycerides. Why does this position? We'll see why. Because the lipase that's either in the digestion or when we are making uh, or in food processing, etc., the positioning of the fatty acid is very important, especially at SN2. SN2 because, for example, uh, lipase, especially during the digestion, this is how. Uh, this is the first position that is targeted during digestion, so SN2. And this is why, for example, in um, uh, vegetable fat, fat and uh, uh, animal fat are not digested the same way because of the position. We'll see in the next slide because of this positioning of uh, SN position. So, when we have, how do you eat this? So, when we have SN as a prefix, so this is like before the name of the fatty acid or the triglyceride, we can, um, it, so if we see it written here, it tells us that uh, the order is in one, two, three position. So for example, if we look at the top, top line, so it's, it's S-T-O-M, meaning steroid acid at carbon 1, oleic acid at carbon 2, and mycelic acid at carbon 3. Why? Because it was, there was an SN written before. Sometimes, if we just say STOM without writing the SN here, here, it doesn't mean that the order means 1, 2, 3 carbons, it can be any positioning and any order. So this is why, for example, if there is no SN written as a prefix before, we can have any combination. We can have SCOM, MSCO, MOS, etc. So this is why it's important to recognize and to know the to know how to be. And then, obviously, there are different combinations. So here I'm giving you this split angle or six combinations of, uh, of this. Uh, there are typical ordering or arrangement of saturated and fat saturated fatty acid in the triglyceride in animal fat and or uh, and plant fat. So here. Um, for example, here you can, I didn't change. I saw it yesterday, but uh, I didn't want to change it. 
to change the, the so for example, when we have plants, so this is the common distribution. You may see exception, but this is a common one. Plant, you have unsaturated fat at the position S2. So this is the 99% cases. Fat, you have unsaturated fat in position two. In animals, you have fat saturated fat in position two. So this is how we will distinguish between fat, animal fat, and and uh, uh, plant fat. To remember, just to re like to remember. So usually we link plant fat as with to beneficial effect or um, so plant fat is beneficial meaning unsaturated meaning uh, unsaturated is in, a, in, in a, is in a position two. So this is this is the way how when I was a student I was remembering this because I mean, we had to remember this. Animals so we have saturated animals usually we have saturated fat in most of the case etc. So saturated is so you can remember this way. Um, so um, and this is how, as I said, I mentioned uh, before. This is why uh, the saturated, the animal fat and, and the and the, lip, the plant fat are digested and assimilated, or or and absorbed or assimilated differently in the tissue and. Uh, in our body in so because of this and because of the light phases that recognize mainly essential positions. So here this is I'm just giving you an example of what we can find. So for example um, we have cocoa cocoa butter it is uh, it can be a combination of different fats which you can see here SN2 is always uh, and O, and oleic acid that is uh, unsaturated fatty acid, and same for animal, uh, animal. So here we have SN2, and I added these here, here just so that in the slide you can see them together, and then we have them on the slide. Uh, uh, so this is saturated fatty acid, and saturated. But all these information are in the previous slide, so you don't have to. Okay. So, um, fat, if you remember, I said there is a blend, of, they are a blend of crystalline of solid and liquid. So, so uh, uh, solid becomes a crystalline form. If you remember, it's the same thing. So, form crystalline, etc. So, when we talk about fat, we talk about butter, margarine, and lard. These are the most known and commonly used. Uh, so, how do I go to the identify? The, the crystalline, so it's the amount of um, the solid within the total amount of fat present in the in the in the in, in the structure. Uh, so usually, when we have fat, when we talk about fat content, we talk about uh, this specific uh, proportion of either solid. And uh, total fat or um, solid, it depends on the matrix or solid within the liquid. So the crystalline structure shouldn't change from one combination to from one to matrix to another. Fats are semi-solid, as I said, or plastic at room temperature, and they contain a range of triglycerides. These triglycerides they can have different times of temperature. And it depends on uh, the uh, length, the chain, etc. Uh, so this is why we can find within the same matrix, we can find uh, or at the same temperature, we can find either solid or uh, either solid or both, uh, sorry, liquid and solid fats. So when we talk about solid fat content. So solid fat content is the proportion of a solid 
inhibit. So it's a proportion. So how many uh, solid, how, how, what's the percentage of solid within a food mass? So for example, if we have 100, meaning this solid, this fat is solid at 100 persons. And then at specific temperature, if we increase the temperature and tell a specific time form, we will see that uh, the fat content or the proportion of fat solid decreases. So this is how we identify the um, melting temperature. So for example, here we have two products. We have product A and we have product B. Product A, so the the the, the graph uh, shows the percentage of solid in food matters, and then here we sh show us an increase of conversion. So fact number ten, it is solid at specific until when we start increasing the conversion, until specific conversion, and then it drops suddenly. So it becomes liquid suddenly. While the B, it has, there is a graduation or gradual uh, melting. So it starts melting as, let's say here we have 30, 40. It starts melting at 30, and there is a proportion that melts at 40, and there is another proportion that melts at x and y. So if we have these two products, what do you think, which one do you think is homogeneous compared to the other? Is it A homogeneous or is it B homogeneous? What do you think? Remember the crystallinity, crystalline uh, sugar, so it's the same principle. Yeah. A? Yeah, why A? Um, because at one time, at a certain temperature, all of it's solid, and then at a different, all of it's yes. Yeah. Does anyone uh, have another another option? Yeah. So this is most logical because a it drops suddenly, meaning that all the fatty acid they have all, all the triglycerides they have the same melting temperature. They are homogeneous. They are the same. So the temperature drops suddenly, while B is should be in case of nature of different if a different fatty acid or different triglycerides, right? and this is why the temperature is not homogeneous or is not the same and the same. Uh, so this is a way how we, we identify the fat content. And here, it just, I just wanted to give you an example. I like this example. So here. It shows, so in, in, in when uh, uh, making chocolate, so these industrials use different types of vegetable oils, different types of uh, cocoa but, but, butter, but they also use different plant based foods. And then they use a combination of them, so it depends on the product, etc. Um, so the cocoa, the cocoa, cocoa butter, has a melting temperature that is ranging from 30 to 37. This is the cocoa. And then when it makes it, it's a pot. When we make the chocolate, it should have a, 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 a melting temperature around 37 degrees. So this is why the chocolate, when you put it in our one, it starts melting because the melting temperature. And then they use other plant vegetable oils and fats to make either harder or soft chocolate. So if they want to make soft chocolate, they use fat that have a uh, uh, proper melting temperature that is lower than 30. And, and this is why, for example, um, there are chocolates uh, that you put them in, in, you just take them in your hand they start melting. You just start, your hands start like to be sticky because they are made with uh, fats that have melting temperature lower than 30. And this is why, for example, I think Ferrero Rocher is 
is one of these examples. It has a melting temperature that is lower than 57, and other one. And this is why, for example, and it, it sometimes does on purpose, because when you have this radiation melting temperature, um, and you, when you put it in your mouth, you, like there is a feeling of cold, um, how to say, cold sensation. So it's like you feel that like you're eating something cold. And this is how they play with the fatty acid. So this is just, a, next time remember when you do it, it's just about fatty acid combination. So this is why uh, I, I wanted to give you this because we, uh, I don't know, I, I, I just like this. Where is my screen? Oh, okay. okay, next. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll add the uh, 10 minutes and then we can go for, for I was going to say for lunch. For break. Okay, uh, so this is what we call the melting temperature. And then melting temperature depends on if the, it's, the, it's, as you said, the combination, etc. If it's homogeneous, the same thing as, as when we talk about sugar, etc. So homogeneous usually uh, it has higher normal temperature compared to heterogeneous, etc. <coughs> when we talk about fat, we need this crystalline structure. These triglycerides uh, changes or vary in their degrees of order or their limits or how they order within the structure, or how they are structured. And this would be called polymorphism. Same as the genetic polymorphism, same here we have fat, or lipid polymorphism, or triglyceride polymorphism. So what does this mean? I, I don't want to, the sentence I read in English, I wrote in English, I wrote in English. In red is, um, you don't have it in your class. So when we talk about polymorphism, we talk about different ways that molecules can, can organize themselves in solid phase. Here we're talking about solid phase. We're talking about fat in solid phase. Um, so this crystalline or solid phase then can differ in physical structure, but they, when they are not, they yield to the same, to the same or to the identical. So yes, they have they may have different um, phase when they're solid, but when they melt, they are liquid, liquid anyway. Uh, it just depends on the top melting temperature. <coughs> the triglyceride, glycerol, sorry, they crystals or these fats or these uh, solid uh, composition, they uh, exist in different forms or different versions of fats. Um, here I'm citing three, there are at least three. So we have the alpha, beta prime, and the beta. There is also gamma. In chocolate, there are at least six forms in fats used up in chocolate. There are at least six forms, so it's different. So let's put it this way. So we have polymorphism fat and a polymorphism cho chocolate is kind of different uh, because there are many combinations. Like so here we will, we will focus on these three, alpha, beta prime, and beta. What does this mean? <coughs> so these alpha and beta, etc., they depend first on their structure. Same as uh, when we have, uh, uh, same as uh, crystalline and uh, amorphous uh, with this all together, the principle is the same. But it depends on the configuration and the conformation of the triglyceride and uh, or the, the position of these fatty acids within the glycerol pathway. So here, you see there are triglycerides. So I just drew them with three three lines. So we have what we call tonic four or tonic four. So we have SN one, position one and three, same way, and the position two in the opposite. So they can be drawn this way, they can be drawn in the opposite. 
small and then redraw them big. And this is a vertical turning fork. And so these are alpha is a random configuration or random pattern. And then their configuration are uh, they are like uh, positioned at 90 degrees and angle of 90 degrees. You will see, you will say, oh, but this doesn't, the top figure doesn't look at the, the, low, the bottom figure. So this is how it is, um, they are uh, shown or they are uh, like identified. So, we, so when we talk about alpha, it's either the top configuration and then the bottom configuration just to show you the angle of positioning of these uh, fork, forks uh, on the chain of the patterns. So then we have, remember alpha is the random one, it's the most heterogeneous one. And we have a beta prime. Beta prime, same, is a turning fork, but the configuration is, these are tilted structures. So they are tilted about 70 degrees Celsius. And they are intermediate. So beta prime is an intermediate. And we have, I'm sorry, and we have a beta. Beta is a stack of, these are stack of chairs, and they are five patterns. So the configuration is the angle that are different. And then, so remember, alpha, beta prime, you have the turning, the turning force. The beta is the more homogeneous. It has high traffic. And these are uh, uh, chairs, so the chairs are stuck. And because here you see there is a space, I mean I told them, like, just to leave a space between them to say that there is heterogeneity, while when we do, you draw the chairs, there is less likely to have less space. So they are tightly packed together. And this is what they make, it makes them more homogeneous. So the uh, degrees is the degree of angle of uh, orientation, it's not the degree of nothing. It's not the temperature. So when we talk about stability, obviously the alpha is less stable than the beta prime and it's less stable than the beta. So here we have to work with melting temperature. What do you think, which one do you think has the highest melting temperature? Remember what we said. We said homogeneous ones should have higher temperature. Is they homogeneous? It takes time for them to melt. So this is why. Homogeneous ones, beta ones will be from uh, the ones that have highest melting temperature. So usually when we have solid so uh, oils, so as the oil they solidify, they go from alpha. So this is the liquid, it's less homogeneous than uh, beta prime in the middle. So just remember, for example, this is the oil. This the beta prime is for example the margarine. See it's uh, it is solid but it is easily spreadable. And then here, for example, you have the butter, or you have fat, it is solid fat. So, here. Beta prime is the, when we talk about industrially talking, especially in making, etc., beta prime is the preferred. So, people, industrials, prefer keeping the oils in the beta prime because it's easily uh, handled. It is easy, easy to handle that. So as I said, in application, an application, baking, we'll talk about shortening. So the beta prime is a desirable, uh, the one in the middle. So we don't have it to, we don't want it to be very solid, and we don't have, want it to be liquid, liquid like that. So how do we keep these beta prime? Just add uh, to this slide. There are different ways of keeping them. You remember when we spoke about the crystallization? And we said, oh, we need a protein agent so that we can, they can interfere with the crystallinity. Remember? It's the same principle, just here we call them differently. 
So when we, if we want to keep the beta prime, we are, we solidify, we start solidifying an oil, an oil, an oil. But we don't want to go further. We want, and we know that, for example, this oil, this, this, the fatty acid that compose this oil, they, uh, they can be liquid at high, at, 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 at room temperature. Um, so what do we do? We add emulsifiers. So emulsifiers, so these are compositions that help mixing the, um, they are interpreting agents, let's put it this way, and then they can have keeping the beta form instead of going further to the So when we talk about uh, one of the very common uses is the sorbitum ester. So these are um, surfactants that fit into the crystalline form. So they go into, it's the same way as the interfering agent. So they go enter the surfactant. So they have hydrophobic regions that align with the carbon chain of the fatty acid chain. Uh, so this is why. And they have the hydrophilic group that align with the carbon the, uh, the carbon, so because of these, if you remember the emulsifier, I will go away, we will talk about it in the future. So they have hydrophobic and hydrophobic region, and this is what makes them alive or mix between the two regions in specific emulsion. So, is it similar to entropy agent? Yes, it is, because the principle is to keep uh, to not have to avoid go further to make more crystalline uh, forms uh, uh, in, in the structure. And then when we talk about uh, chocolate, um, it's another way of, of um, uh, how to say, it? it's another example of polymorphism and how this polymorphism uh, can uh, lead to undesirable form or undesirable changes. And one of very well cited in the moon example is the blooming or the bloom of chocolate. So the chocolate is meant at specific temperature. If the melting is not done properly or at proper temperature, uh, then when it's solidifying, it forms this specific uh, structure. So um, the white or gray spots on the surface will be this one on the right. Um, so, this, so the chocolate will lose the glossy surface. So it's not like shiny or glossy anymore. This is due to the law, to the transition from one polymorphic state to another polymorphic state. And this is due mainly to the polymorphism of the cocoa bottle. If you remember, I said chocolate has about six polymorphic states or versions. So this is why it's easy to have or to have these indecisible changes in the chocolate. There are two solutions, either adding emulsifiers or tampering. So tampering chocolate is uh, is controlling the temperature, the melting, and the solidification of the, of the, of the. Another example is the ester solidification. So, remember ester solidification? So it's a one way of uh, keeping, creating, or keeping more beta form compared to uh, uh, beta prime compared to beta 
talk about random and rest verification. We don't want one, like we just want to mix them together. Then when we talk about enzymatic and rest verification, we, will, we can have either random positioning or a diet position. We want this specific fatty acid in SN2 or this specific, we we'll remove it from SN2 and sugar. I'll give you some examples. So these are the ways how we're doing it. Why we do the diversification? Because we want to change the proper physical properties of all the Remember, the interstification shouldn't change. This was a lot of question of the exam. Shouldn't change the composition as as it is. It should change the form. The can go from homogeneous to heterogeneous, etc. So it helps. This interstification helps increasing the melting point increasing the solid content and altering the crystalline structure. It is one of the first used and commonly used there, uh, and as an alternative way to partial hydrogenation. If you remember, hydrogenation added hydrogen to the double bond, so then we will have to avoid oxy auto oxidation or oxidation of the liquid. So this is how we can one of the very emerging topics of interest in the use of intercertification is to use it to, in, uh, to make infant formula products with specific PAGs, molecular species, uh, either animals, mainly with, with uh, animal oil, sorry, vegetable oils, and then intercertification to put them in a specific or to mimic put them in specific positioning, we'll see it in a few slides, and to mimic the composition of breast milk or human breast milk. And this will help the fat absorption in humans. How do we do it? There are two main stages. First, we hydrolyze. So we need to break these ester bonds. Then we esterify, we change the positioning. So either we redistribute uh, fat within the TAG or we exchange between the TAG. So it's there are the two So let's say we can, for example, start from one product that is more homogeneous. We see greens in one way in the side and brown in one side. And we can go to more heterogeneous fat. So there are, we can go from A to B or from B to A. Going from A to B is a random esterification, so there was very well order, order uh, and then now they are switched randomly, so this is what we call random esterification. And then the direct you go from more heterogeneous to more structured and more organized one. Same one, which one? The same question, is it A or B? It's the same question I asked to this slide Which one should have um, uh, is more uh, more easily to form the beta core, so the logical should be in A because it's more homogeneous. So homogeneity, more homogeneous, are uh, associated with the beta core uh, of uh, uh, fat acid. So as I said, there are two techniques or two different ways, either the enzymatic or the chemical interpretation. Enzymatic, we need to use microbial enzymes, these are like lipases. So the lipases they cut the specific the, the fatty acid and they have reorganized uh, they so then they can be reorganized later. So these specific enzymes will hydrolyze or intercify, but they mainly hydrolyze. So the lipase is mainly hydrolyzed, but there are others that can enter the technique was uh, developed in the 80s. It provides a cheaper source uh, for a confectionery fat to replace cocoa butter. So it's easy to set up and easy to handle. So we need a tank, we need, and then we need to add enzymes. So there is one way, this is kind of the simplest form of the. Uh, so the enzymes go from one side to another, they are put in contact with the product to interesting fat. And this is how they are interested. Chemical intensification, we need to use a catalyst. Uh, so the catalyst, there are different catalysts, the main user is sodium metal type. 
it involves the hydro oasis and the rundown or redistribution of the fatty acids. So if you remember, enzymatic intensification, it can be directed or indirected. Chemical one is only indirect. It was, it's an old technique. It was developed in the 40s. It was used mainly to modify the solid fat content of blood to improve its probability and dating properties. So this is the, old, the first and main use, and then they started using it differently. The second is different. Here, this is one of the simplest traffic, but like, it needs a more complex installation in the, in the, uh, in the in industry. So usually there are different kinds, one in catalyst, and one in the, in the oil, and then one in the mixture, etc. So this is why it is not easy to install, and it is higher, for, uh, more, more expensive compared to a chemical one. How do we do this? So first, let's start with the direct one. We want to start, we want specific organization within the triglyceride. So we first, Hydrolyze. So we have, for example, this combination, saturated and unsaturated fatty acid. We need first to hydrolyze the triglyceride. So what we should do? We increase the temperature. When we increase the temperature, they, these they melt, and then, they, uh, uh, then we add the catalyst. The catalyst will just break these extra uh, linkages. And then we start dropping the temperature. When we drop the so then the, when we drop the temperature, we so so dropping the temperature meaning solidifying one fatty acid compared to the other. So when we drop the temperature, let's say we increase it at 90 degrees, and then we drop it at 70 degrees. 70 degrees the ones that are in, that are not that that are they can solidify 70 degrees, so they are kind of put aside when you move it. And then we repeat the cycle. So we kind of get rid of these ones, let's say. Saturated fatty acid at 70 degrees salt. And then we end by having, and then we repeat the cycle. And then, and then so on, until we, so when we the, get rid of it, it is kind of put aside to be reorganized again. So this is how we play, so we play temperature up and down, different cycles of the temperature, but we add, and this is how we change the, uh, we divert the, uh, we, change, we go from more heterogeneous to uh, uh, more heterogeneous to more homogeneous. Uh, the other way, so it's the same, so if we go here, First, we went from more heterogeneous to homogeneous. Here, we're switching. So we're going from the, the other position. So what we do? Same, we need to hydrolyze the triglyceride. We re-aerosterify at higher at higher temperature. Then they become all liquid, and we we keep doing. It. So there is a lot of organization. So when we, re when we go to the opposite direction, we don't need a specific order. It can be any order. They can put, be put together, these fatty acids, they can be put together, re esterified so we, have, we, we don't have to control this. Then, another example, so as I said, we go from homogeneous to heterogeneous, or we go from heterogeneous to homogeneous, either directed or indirect. Another way to use of intensification is for the part is as an as I said as an alternative of partial hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is adding hydrogen to the double bond. So then instead of having unsaturated fatty acids that are oxidated easily and doesn't keep the good quality of food, we hydrogenate and we have for example fat. So usually solid fat, but there is a problem with trans fat, as I said. So how we do this? We first fat with saturated fat. Saturated fat that we know that it is not a trans fat particle. So how we do it? We just mix. This is a random esterification. 
we cannot control it. So it is a random distribution. So we mix it with a fat, we change the temperature, and there is a conversion from ore to a plastic fat. So the, this is how. We, so we're mixing the fats together uh, to obtain different fragments of and this is how we can play with the consistency of the fat. How we do use this in the food industry? There are different uses. So for example, one of the uses is in uh, meat technology. So uh, where plant oils or vegetable oils are used to substitute fat from animals. Uh, that has been linked to different diseases, obesity, cardiovascular disease, etc. Et so then, uh, an option, a good option, was to uh, su substitute. So either, for example, can be replaced uh, fat, uh, animals in the meat butter and killer meat product. The problem is that if, if the animal, if the oil are used as they are, they're first liquid. They have different colors, and, and they don't react the same way as a fat. So, we don't, if we use it as they are, we don't obtain the right texture, and we don't obtain the right color. The best way is to interesterify, and then you have them. So, when we interesterify, we mix the the, the the sorry the fatty acid. So then we change the melting conversion and then if they become more um, solid so either we go from alpha, alpha polymorphic to beta prime or beta and this will have uh, making uh, as, uh, food as a texture and color closer to the product that is made with animal fat it is healthier and it decreases the susceptibility to liquid, liquid, liquid oxidation and it has, as I said, better uh, color and texture. And the certification can be used in human milk. I spoke about um, human milk. So human milk, it is a combination of saturated and unsaturated uh, uh, milk. So unsaturated, saturated, Remember the saturated of animal milk, animal fat is always in the middle in the C, in SN2. Here we have the palmitic acid at SN2, and uh, we have unsaturated fatty acid, uh, linoleic acid, and alpha linoleic acid in the position one and two. So this is how the milk, human milk is characterized. Human milk is easily digested in by infants because they have the light phases and specific um, uh, and it has some gas bacteria that are involved in the hydrolysis of or the digestion of, of the milk. Um, however, uh, because of many reasons, uh, breast milk or human breast milk cannot be available, cannot be used for all infants. So there was a way uh, it was uh, so the, like, to replace it with the use of uh, infant formula. Infant formula milk, uh, infant formula are usually made with vegetable oils. Vegetable oils, they don't have the same position, the same structure as breast milk, obviously. So they have palmitic acid rather than being a CSN2, it, it is SN1 and SN3. This repositioning of palmitic acid and repositioning um, it was associated with the calcium deficiency. Why? Because the calcium, it was, it was kind of, with this saturated fatty acid, it was kind of precipitating, or making kind of a saponification, and precipitating. And then with the action, so there was kind of pre precipitation, or reaction between the calcium of milk, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and the fatty acid, with in addition to our action of the lipases that are present in uh, infant gut, so this was what makes them um, lead to calcium deficiency in infant. 
The best way was to replace them to have human milk substitute or human fat or human or what we call human milk fat panels. So these are called next generation fat or structural lipids. And they have they are so the way how we can do them is through the enterous fermentation. I'm giving you two examples and these are not the you may find other examples, but I am mean, just giving you two examples that kind of what this one was published last year, so what was the one? And so here what they did, they uh, mixed it, first one they mixed it fantasy oil with an alpha 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 little like oil which is a saturated fat that was made from a specific, this was a specific study from a sick form uh, uh, insect. So, and this was a little, this was part of an emerging study uh, using this specific one. How they did it? So, they had found it all, I found it with all, they mixed it together, and they, so two oils, they entered it three five to obtain this mixture. Saturated fat, found it in the middle, and then unsaturated, so this mimics the um, uh, human milk. Same example here, what they did, so the first oil is made from lard oil, and they used the lard, this was a specific uh, term. They entered the fat at different temperature, and they look at it at the composition. So this is a way how to use the interest fermentation and uh, make it. So what do, why do we think there is and alternative, they use it, and one of them they use like lipids. So here it's lipoprotein, and here it's lipoprotein. So these are lipases. I think they're extracted from from beef and from pork, from animals. One of the worms to animals. Why do you think that these are enzymatic and not chemical reactions? What? Because they are older, they are directed. We need specific. Do you remember I said chemical, it, it is indirected, so kind of random interpretation. For enzymatic, it can be bought, but in here, it's directed. So we need specific positioning of a positive acid at the SN2 to mimic human. How about emulsions? Emulsions. And emulsifying, so we have seen this in the previous slide, uh, the previous lecture. So these are discrete particles that are dispersed in continuous space. So it can be either oil in water or water in oil. So these emulsions, they have lower stability. So because oil and water cannot be mixed properly, so they are easily separated. The best way to do it to stabilize them is to use the emulsifier. So here, this is, we have seen this uh, previously, oil in water or water in oil. So what are these emulsifiers? We, call, we also call them surfactants. So these are alkylic uh, molecules. They contain hydrophobic and non-hydrophobic or hydrophilic groups or polar and non-polar. So that they can be attached to both uh, liquid, li uh, liquid or oil and water. Uh, 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 part of it or uh, um, they are considered as additives that they promote the formation and enhance the stability of emulsion. They pr pr provide physical benefits, um, viscosity, they reduce the, the, the change of viscosity, uh, they can have, we can have um, uh, this emulsion as a complexation with starch or start complexation and they can help increasing the crystallization or reducing the crystallization of fats. So as um, you can see here we have non-polar units here that they can be attached to the oil where the where the polar ends they have the repulsive charges if you remember which we saw that last time. They are repulsive and this is why they, they cannot be attracted, they are repulsive, they are rejected from each other and this is why they stabilize the, 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 the emotion. Um, 
cysteine carbons. Um, short chain lamps can make excellent emulsifier, but can react with water to produce soapy and undesirable of flavor. So when we are making emulsifier or choosing emulsifier, we have to be careful in choosing the right uh, lead to, so to avoid the hydrophilic uh, uh, rust. So, when we talk about emulsifiers, we also talk about HLV or hydrophilic hydrophobic balance. So, this uh, this is kind of a, a relative size of hydrophobic and hydrophobic um, uh, section of an emulsifier that these sizes of uh, that they determine uh, its behavior. So either an emulsifier can be used as an emulsifier in water oil emulsion or in water oil liquid emulsion. This depends on the size of the hydrophilic and the lactophilic uh, proportion. So a more lactophilic emulsifier can be used um, or is used in water in oil emulsion and we have it. So these are the first examples for citrolipids that are commonly used as uh, emulsifiers. When we talk about emulsifiers, as I said, we, uh, they are mostly we use for phospholipids because they are easy to get and they are cheaper. Phospholipids can be found in uh, uh, soil city. So, uh, so this is a byproduct of, uh, we'll see next week, of uh, soy bean oil. Um, so when we make it, lecithin is the one for doing the processing of uh, or making soil uh, bean oil, we can obtain the lecithin. It can be uh, used as an emulsifier. Eggs are also a good uh, source of that for phospholipid, uh, and they're used as an emulsifier. Monoglyceride. And then sodium soil uh, uh, lactulase. So if you remember, we said this can be. This was uh, used. It was also used in uh, uh, to avoid the staining of bread. Then we have the sorbidum ester. If you remember, we saw it uh, in the previous one. So they prevent the crystallization of lipids and preserve the beta form. Mm -hmm. uh, why they preserve the beta form? Because these are lipophilic emulsifiers, so they have a long chain uh, of hydrocarbon here, and this is what helps uh, stabilizing uh, these structures or keeping the vapor form physical. The bones and starch are used as emulsifier. Uh, they mainly um, and I keep saying this, so I, I don't really like when I talk about starch, starches and um, and uh, gums. I don't. So these are long points of life. With a, with uh, uh, I don't really like talking about emulsifiers because um, they're not really by definition they're not really emulsifiers. They are thickening agents. But because they have stabilizing these emulsions, this is why there are some, you may even find this in books, they are kind of categorized as emulsifiers. But they are not. They are thickening agents or gelling agents. So um, this one is taken or generated continuous upper space in, in, in the oil, in an oil emulsion, and they can do the opposite work. So, it can be used for both, both an oil and oil. So let's have this example. So we have a French dressing, um, French dressing, uh, or salad dressing. It's a water in oil emulsion. Uh, so it has canola oil. This is a recipe: canola oil, vinegar, mustard flour, flour paprika, and xanthan oil. Xanthan oil probably is a polysaccharide. It has Polypropylene, glycol, alginate, and spices in here. So, what do you think? Where, where do you think is the emulsifier? Any idea? 
brother, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised to know which one is the most surprised. Guess. Any guess? Yeah, I remember last year someone guessed it. What? I'm not going to be really good. Oh. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. The most of us. This is why, for example, when we make we make uh, dressing at home, we add the most stars and all that, just kind of mix it, mix it, and to be able to to uh, keep this not separate. Paprika, yeah, paprika, because it has a specific structure. This is why it's used as a emulsifier. Paprika is also used as a coloring agent because it's red, and it is. Also, can be also used as antimicrobial. Although the AW here is not that high. Which one is stabilized? Can be usually used as a thickening agent to stabilize polysaccharides. Yep, the Duncan gum and the alginate. Alginate is a polysaccharide. EDTA is a chelator agent. So it helps, it avoids the auto-oxidation. Spices are okay, so for flavor, but they are antimicrobials. Sugar is good for flavor, but it reacts, it also reacts with sugar. Okay, how about this one? This is a mayonnaise. This is kind of a recipe of mayonnaise. So we have it in the salad bowl of the salad. Oil, vegetable oil, we have lemon juice, egg, um, uh, egg yolk, and so we mix totally with we use a uh, little manually and for with uh, a mixture, and then we keep adding oil slowly until it before the consistency. Oh, this should be a big question. What was, what's the, is it an oil in oil or oil in water and water? This is an oil in water. I know it doesn't make sense, but it is oil in water. Because the oil droplets that are packed, packed into a very small amount of water. Here is no, almost no water. Like the water is coming from, from the juice and the oil, which is uh, not really. So it's um, the oil is the droplets. See, there are two small amounts of water. Within this water, we have droplets. It's like kind of putting a big volume into a small volume. And this is why we have to keep mixing. Egg function is a multiplier. So why we add the oil slowly and we beat the oil very high? Because of this, we don't have it because it was easy. Why we need to really mix? Because we need to break down the oil into very small droplets. Because these are the droplets that are dispersed in very tiny, small amount of water. So we need to uh, uh, like break this, break this droplet oil and then they can mix it because they are make one mixing with the, with the, with the egg uh, with the egg so they surround this droplet and stabilize the emotion and the water also comes, a little bit of water comes from the, from the eggs so see, this is one we have to mix I can give you, it's interesting, I really uh, encourage you to go and look at the uh, uh, Industrial margarine. Margarine is something like a butter. So it's a water in oil. Here I am giving you an example of different types of margarine. So we have this is the regular one, Bissell. It has 70 cal calories per serving. So it's constituted, it's, it is mainly um, made of 75% oil less than 16% of water. It has um, soil sitting as an emulsifier and um, vegetable non electrolyte as another emulsifier and potassium sulfate as an antimicrobial. Then we have less calories. One with less calories. One with less oil or less fat. So, because it has to be, a preparation has 
very viscous. So what we need to do, we need to add thickening agent and emulsifier to keep the structure. So if you go to the larger, so you may have it at home in this house. So based on the larger either the like regular one or the one with lower calories, they should have the same consistency. The color is a little bit different, but the consistency is the same. So, how we do it? How it's done here? They added the gelatin. Gelatin is a jelly agent. We'll see it when we talk about the protein in a bit. And they added the whey protein same. They have the lecithin as an emulsifier and a monoglossal. So, in this way, they added the gelatin as a jelly agent. They could add they could have added the, um, so they said yeah, it's, uh, these are the combinations. They could have also added uh, starch, for example. Starch is a jelly agent, uh, or thickening agent, as and they said here in the example. So here, it's even lower calorie, so they even increase it, going from 58 to 68% of water, and they added the gelatin the same way, but they added rice starch. So this would have to thicken or to make this chocolate thick. And then the consistency between 70, 35, and 25 calories shouldn't per serving shouldn't change. So this is the way it's kind of a schematic representation. So we have droplets of water and droplets of fat or fat crystals. And then that are uh, put in a specific structure. And because this is kind of a, 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 a gel of homogeneous, we have a liquid oil, in, 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 um, sorry, an emulsion, we have a liquid oil that is also um, distributed. I, uh, this was an animation, so that's why I couldn't add it in your class. So, the principle, this principle of adding water, decreasing oil is applicable to uh, in other products. So lower the fat and then to low, be able to lower the fat you need to increase the water content but you need to add a thickening agent to keep the consistency of the product. This is the rule, especially when we talk about fats and, and fat. Okay, mayonnaise. Mayonnaise, we have another example. So we can have regular and light. When we talk about light, uh, it's the one that has less oil and uh, less calories. Uh, for the light one, the um, modified corn starch is added to keep it uh, thick, or to keep this consistency. So, if you, as I said, I always try to pay with with with, uh, with ingredients to. Uh, we add either uh, we add we add either the jelly agent, gelatin for example, or specific starch. Or we add mm, a thickening agent here as a starch. How about fat replacers? The name says it. So they are used to replace fat in products with high fat content. Um, now, for like, health purposes, nutrition purposes, etc to reduce fat content. Um, so fat replacers uh, are usually in frozen desserts, processed meat, cheese, and sour foods. There are two categories. They are what we call fat substitutes and fat mimics. Fat substitutes, it substitutes the fat. So it, ha it, is, it has a structure that is similar because we need to substitute, just remove and replace. Um, a, a structure similar to the, to the THGs, it substitutes the fat on the basis of one on one. So if we remove one gram, we replace, we replace it with one gram. Uh, it has to be for some the same structure, physical structure and functional characterization uh, as the fat. So then it is, um, it is uh, so that consumer don't see the difference between uh, the real fat and the fat replacer. Usually these fat substitutes are synthetic, so they don't have any energy added uh, to the food market or to the food product. Or energy or, or, or no energy or, or calories. 
So this 
why we cannot have uh, um, uh, have, uh, have it. So when it's added uh, to the ice cream, for example, it helps increasing the viscosity and the creaminess, uh, and it simulates the, the creaminess or the creamy structure that is made with the fat. Um, they have they are shown to have lower calories, uh, lower in calories, so two calories uh, uh, per gram of ice cream, for example, compared to nine uh, if they were fat. Lipids, uh, so this is what we call structured lipids. These are emerging technology structured lipids. So these structured lipids use uh, the technology of enterocertification to create oils with triglycerides that have short and medium chain fatty acids and con uh, contents. So we need, so the, the, sh the length of fatty acids uh, fatty acids are shorter than the natural oils. So they have the supposed to have lower calorie intake. And it's just kind of to draw the, the way how it is. So it's an intensification and it's usually microbial intensification because we need to switch it. How about lipid oxidation? It's lipid oxidation. This is how we call it. So uh, um, which uh, when we talk about lipid, talk about lipid density, we also refer to the deterioration of fat. So the fat is deteriorated, it's no longer good enough to be consumed. So it results in the formation of compounds that are responsible for off flavor and aroma of product on fat. So there are two deteriorations. There is the oxidative density, that is the most common one, and there is the hydraulic um, lactic rancidity. Uh, it is well um, uh, so this rancidity it is uh, one of the well studied uh, phenomenon or deterioration because it happens in um, uh, very often and plays a role in different foods. Uh, it happens in different foods. So. Uh, the oxidative, oxidative rancidity uh, because it's oxidative, so it involves uh, a reaction with uh, an oxygen. Um, so the oxidative uh, rancidity it can be due either to an auto oxidation. This is what we will be what we will be talking about, and then the photosensitization. So I give you the example of photosensitization, but these are extra slides just for your knowledge. I didn't want to skip this. I won't be covering this. Uh, in the lecture, but I give you the slides just for you, for the extra slides just for your knowledge. Um, uh, the ph photosensitization is a reaction molecule of oxygen with liquid via light light reaction. So when the oils are exposed to light, so this is what, where photosensitization happens. Oxidative rancidity, uh, yes, it's very well studied, it's very hard to be, oh, very difficult to study, because it's very difficult to study a rancidity or the oxidation within a food market. So this is why researchers, they created models, they call model systems. So these are um, uh, uh, single unsaturated fatty acids that they are using in different types of reaction to measure the rancidity. The rancidity. Uh, the rate of rancidity is measured by like, different techniques. Usually it is measured at 25 degrees. And then, it, we, so like, the rule or the baseline is 25 degrees. And then this is what we consider as 25 and the room temperature. And then that can change from one to another. So this is, Kind of the chart of uh, uh, oxidation. Unsaturated fatty acids, obviously, they have zero alcoholic group, so they don't have uh, free radicals to oxidate, and they cannot. For example, if we do this, if we use the, the model system and we look at, we incubate the fatty acid at room temperature. There is no there is no oxidation. So here, non-saturated, this is the given in the form, non-saturated, it has an uh, oxidative rate of one. Like, there is no oxidative rate. Then, unsaturated one, so unsaturated, for example, you have one double bond, one alkyl group, it takes 82 hours for this oil to oxidate, or to start oxidating at room temperature. 
oxidation, oxida the oxidation happens and higher the oxidation rate. So this is seen here. So you have 82 hours in omega B18. So the alpha level acid, for example, this is the main main fatty acid or main uh, fatty acid, omega-3 acid, fatty acid in classic oil, and it takes 1.3 hours to oxidate. So for a long bond, if you have your like for people who take eat classic oil. So usually people grind it. So if you grind the fatty uh, classic oil, you have to store it immediately uh, covered from the light and uh, for the green at least to avoid the oxidation otherwise uh, the oil is oxidated and it's not high oil anymore so this is how we um, and this is how we set for example the uh, not only the oxidation rate but the storage etc then there are different factors so uh, the fa it doesn't only depend on the double bond and uh, the length but it also depends on the amount of oxygen present so high level of oxygen will increase presence of antioxidants or co-oxidants so antioxidants they stop the oxidation pro-oxidants they just enhance the oxidation rate so uh, pro-oxidants these are um, metals mainly and this is why we uh, um, so for specific unsaturated oil we avoid storing them in uh, metal uh, structure or container because it increases the oxidation. The temperature, as we showed, and water activity. So here we will just go fast through like, the, the steps. So there is a, an initiation. There are oxidation, they go through four steps. Initiation, chain proliferation, chain branching reaction, and termination. So let's start with the three. First. So when we talk about the initiation, so the fatty acid here, you remember this uh, formula, formulation, fatty acid. Then the hydrogen is abstracted from the fatty acid to yield to a free radical. So R point is the uh, R of free radical, and this uh, com uh, radical compound is emperor electron, so easy to react. These are all numbers of electrons. So this happens near to the double bond, obviously, because we need to work on the unsaturated fat. This, the reaction is very slow. It happens um, uh, slowly, but it can be catalyzed by light and nickels. Then, when we have, once we have this free radical, then there is an addition of oxygen, because we're talking about oxidation. I know some people may have an uh, exam, so feel free to leave if you want. Um, anyway, I'm recording, so no worries. If you have to leave, because I think some of you have an uh, exam this afternoon, so I'm leaving. So then, there is a formation of what we call peroxid radical. And this is a chain reaction, so this kind of a continuous, and this is what we call the propagation. So it's one radical and it keeps going. And then, because of the formation of these hydroxy peroxidized, and these are odorless and tasteless compounds, they don't contribute to the deterioration, this intermediate, but they are unstable. So they are, they, they contribute to what we call the branching chain reaction. So these are kind of a product for another reaction. So here, when we talk about, so these are the kind of Hydroperoxidase, and they keep going with other reactions. So, uh, for this is what we call a chain reaction and a reaction. They involve the breakdown of the hydroxy, the hydroperoxide compound, into free radicals. So, the product that results of these reactions is here they are volatile and they are responsible for the off flavor and the oil. These products are mainly ketone, they can be formation of alcohol as well, and the aldehyde. Aldehyde, I use it as 
markers of oxidation. So if we want to measure the, the oxidation, we can measure the presence of aldehyde in the compound. And then there is the termination. So formation of a compound that is not free radical. So there is no free radical anymore here, as you can see. So our R goes R together. So one free radical is represent 100 uh, uh, 100 uh, hydroxyl bond. So, uh, so the, the products are dimers, and there is an increase in molecular weight and viscosity of the uh, So, because of all these changes, there is uh, changes in molecular weight, and which leads to the increase of viscosity and the changes of the object. As I said here, this is a lot covering. This is just for your knowledge, so that you know. Uh, I, uh, I forgot to put extra slide, extra slides here. So this is for your notes. Whenever I put extra slide, meaning it's just for you to uh, report what I'm interested in. So how do we prevent the oxidity or oxidation? So we need to add antioxidants. Is uh, there are different antioxidants? So uh, the, the listed here. Uh, one of the very known, well known, etc. is the, the tocopherol. Tocopherol is the vitamin C. So uh, these are naturally occurring in, in many uh, uh, plant world. They react with the free radicals to become free radicals that radicals themselves. Um, the vitamin E free radicals is, is deactivated by oxidation. Oxidation in Tokyo. So it's easy, easily added, easily obtained, and easily reacting to stop the reaction. How we do this? Um, as I said, it's the uh, react, so the AH it becomes it's itself reacting with the alkyl uh, radical to stop the reaction. So here the vitamin E is an AH here. Um, and as you can see here, there is a change in the, so this is the peroxide value, peroxide value, PV, peroxide value is the way of measuring the oxidation. So as you can see here, the peroxide value becomes very high when the oil is alone, while the uh, uh, antioxidant, it, it uh, delays the starting of the oxidation for a specific time and it goes up. So this is why we need some kind of antioxidant to avoid this. Then there is the action of, of uh, so the, these antioxidants, they can act differently. So either by what we call tension or attracting, so single oxygen can be tension or as a, a kind of, kind of a trait. And the tincture, they can be beta carotene, they can be lipopen, they can be other compounds. Or they, they, are, they are chelators. So we we catch chelators. So usually citric acid and mostly EDTAs are used. EDTAs are chelators. They inhibit the oxidation by chelating the metal that catalyzes the uh, auto oxidation and photosensitization. So chelators, they attract. They keep a trap to the trap the the metal that they don't react uh, or they get don't get involved in the reaction or they help speeding the reaction. So remember this, the chart of water activity. The lipid oxidation, it's a little bit tricky. So if you can see here, the lip the, the, the curve of lipid oxidation goes from higher, very high when they are, it's, it's a very low AW, and then it goes down and it goes up again. Okay. So this is the lipid oxidation, because there are different ways. So the oxidation can happen in a very dry um, product, or a very wet or liquid, or, uh, or where the AW is very high, um, in the of the AW, right? <laughs> so here, for example, zero, zero point, around 0 0.3 to uh, zero, up to here, there is what we call the removal of surrounding 
maintaining the quality and is a good antioxidant and or effective antioxidant can be used for food. And they also use the tea bar. The tea bar, because they, uh, they, they, uh, they are just, as I said, just a re react, re uh, color makes it uh, fast. Uh, lower tea bar meaning lower or less oxidation, meaning higher quality or better quality. And as you can see here, the control without antioxidants it has higher antioxidant or higher T bars compared to the one or to the rosemary or to, to the grassy. And you can see here the oxidation starts increasing over time. And this is one of the this is how we do the uh, we do the we do the we do the um, um, okay we have about ten minutes and then I didn't want to put any conclusion. I didn't want to put okay, that's like empty like this. Uh, because I wanted to hear from you the message of today. Yeah, we still have five minutes to do it. So what's your conclusion?